early in the morning in 1945 outside of Alamogordo, the Trinity's test site. Oppenheimer and anybody else working on the Manhattan Project witnessed the detonation of the world's first atomic device. And the baby photographs that they got from that event were the kickstart of images that are not just scientific in nature, but also powerful artistic statements. How's it, how's it? Those photographs, I've, I've always been fascinated by nuclear weapons. Something, maybe it's because I was a child in the 80s. <laughs> you know, and that's kind of, a, kind of a thing. But you know, those, those images have lingered with me for ages. There's something primeval about witnessing those photographs that were taken at a millionth of a second just after the initial, you know, the initial detonation. And of course, it's not somebody sitting there with a motor drive sort of going, where are we going to get that one, right? These were taken by very specialist cameras developed latterly, you know, after these, these events by a scientist called Doc Egerton. Now, you may not know his name, you may not really be familiar with the work that he pioneered with strobe lighting and then these cameras they built specifically to document the you know the atomic uh, detonations that were capable of, of taking you know shutter speeds of millions of a second and even though they have been explained in this video i still can't understand how they work this O'Brien camera achieved ultra high speeds through use of an image dissector and a film drum whirling inside. This camera was capable of making 15 million pictures a second. My first exposure to Harold Egerton's photography was in this book here. This, this is Disney's Wonderful World of Knowledge, Volume 9, Science and Technology. So this is kind of like an Encyclopedia Britannica for kids where they would talk about you know, various ideas, nature, animals, you know, technology and, and so forth, history, using Disney characters. And I remember they turned up in a box one day, this must be 1981, 1982, somewhere around there. And these are, these are, the, these are they, these are the, the, the guys there. And I would page through them and it was fascinating. And a lot of my love of photography was kick-started by the photographs in these books. And there's two here. So you can see there on the right, there's a photograph of a water droplet on a red table and there's a playing card being shot with a bullet. Now, the thing that bothered me the most when I first saw these photographs was how do you aim at a bullet so it slices through the thin edge of a playing card, right? But these two photographs have stuck with me for years and years and years. I and mean, they were taken by a guy called Doc Egerton, who I've, I've mentioned a couple of times already in this video. They are the beginning of this kind of super high speed photography that he was working on with his, his team. And I've always kind of felt that photography is, you know, art and it's science. But when I was younger, it felt like it was more science. Photography is a process. It's something we can replicate. There is a, there is a technique to it. There's a, there's a machine that we use as a camera, and light, and you know, we're in control of these things. It's almost like an experiment you, you're turning on, much like Doc was doing with his work. And you, and you have to look at this particular video of this, this idea in action to start to see the artistic side of things. Through this invention, you can examine machinery in motion. Here, a common electric fan is used in a simple demonstration that even I can understand, or can I? Anyway, when you direct this light on a fan and synchronize the light flashes to the revolutions of the fan, the blades appear to be stationary. To make sure they aren't, it's better to turn an ordinary light on the fan than to stick a finger into it. Effects evident only while a machine is in motion are thus easily discovered. In case you're still skeptical, we'll drop an egg. Fresh, I hope. Yes? No. That egg smashed in the blink of an eye, but let's drop another and see what really happens. It bounces from blade to blade before it breaks. Interesting. Note the narrow blades on this fan. 
It's an old-fashioned air storer upper that gives off with a minimum of breeze and a maximum of noise. And so, using smoke to point up the action, our prof shows us what these fan blades actually do to the air. Chopping the ozone, the narrow blades send off small whirlpools of air which quickly break up. In seeking a fan that would be more silent and efficient, designers wanted a blade that created less air disturbance. Wider blades, through patient experiments made possible by the stroboscope and other related equipment, comma, was the solution. These blades created a smoother flow of larger whirlpools, and the vortices were of longer duration. This meant less atmospheric disturbance, hence less noise. In fact, electric fans in offices are now so silent they no longer disturb sleeping employees, period. When you get these little lovely confluences where images that are taken specifically for a, a scientific purpose end up becoming art. I, I love that. I think it appeals something to my analytical nature. The photographs of atomic weapons being detonated have stayed in my consciousness probably you know, because I was a child of the 80s and it was it was always there on somebody's mind but there's something beautiful about them and I don't mean necessarily that we kind of look at you know, the beauty and the horror of the thing and the, the juxtaposition and and trying to be a little bit more kind of mm, you know the, the, the hidden meaning but it's that seeing something that we cannot see Photography has this, this amazing capacity to show us modern things, or everyday things rather, in a way that we cannot see. At a very basic level, this is simply, you know, holding up a camera and taking a photograph of something you're standing next to somebody else, and they go, wow, how did you see that? That's amazing, right? That's more of an artistic way of, of using the camera, of seeing something that people can't see from a compositional point of view. But these images of, of apples being exploded, of, you know, the, of the playing cards, of, of all sorts of you know, crazy ideas that they were using. And I, I, I can only imagine, it must have been quite fun to work in that environment and say, you know, what other things can we explore? Where can we go with this? Those photographs, you know, they're much like the, the, the images that were being, you know, tried out in the, in the late 1800s, you know, people like Edward Mybridge with his horses, you know, running across to see if, if the bet was true that a horse would actually be fully airborne at some point during a canter. You know, of, of people doing certain things. And of course, you know, that was a very basic level because Mybridge would use you know, multiple cameras that he would, they, they would then trip. Whereas, you know, Harold Egerton, they're developing these crazy cameras with, you know, electric shutters and all sorts of stuff that I just, I mean, that's, that's way beyond my pay grade when it comes to things. But you cannot argue with the results. There are, I, I think, you know, within the whole genre of photography, there's, there's only a handful of photographs that I would probably want to have on my wall as, as let's say, let, as let's call them artistic pieces. And the apples and the nuclear bombs and the stuff like that, they fall into that category. What that says about my interior decorating choices, um, I, I don't really know. But the point is that they are firmly artistic, certainly my point of view. I don't know what you feel about them. I mean, you know, do you think they're just kind of, they're just interesting, but not particularly exciting? Or do you find them captivating in a way that you can't quite put your finger on? This, this not being able to put your finger on things. <laughs> it, seems, it seems it's always like a little wall that we bump into and stuff. It's like, you know, we, it, we feel that we need to kind of explain why we like something or, or dislike something. Often, I, I think it's, you know, I fall back in using the word vibe. So, I, you know, I like the vibe of the thing. And very much, 
you know, that is something that applies to another photograph that's in this book. Again, being a child of the 80s, I was introduced to the space race, not through the Apollo Mercury missions, but through the space shuttle. I remember being called in, I was outside playing, you know, when they did the first space shuttle launch. But in this book of the science and technology, there was this wonderful photograph, this iconic photograph of the Saturn V rocket taking off. And I have always had a fascination with, with space since those moments. And, 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 the, and the photography that the NASA space program has produced, especially in the early days, is, it feels like it fits firmly into this kind of like, it's the vibe of the thing for me. It's not, it's not purely scientific photography. It's not purely art photography, because obviously you're not going to go up into space and just, I'm going to take some photographs when the mood strikes me. Those images are there as scientific record. It's always, it, whenever I think about this, I have to sort of wonder if, you know, the NASA astronaut training program includes, you know, you know compositional, uh, you know, guidelines and, you know, artistic vision and, and things like that. I mean, obviously it must include technical, you know, ways of how to use a camera and how to make sure the exposures are correct and, and things of that nature. But either they just got lucky or, the astronauts themselves were so in tune with the, the uniqueness of the nature. Maybe that's why they, they look so, so awesome, because these are unique images. But the photographs, especially from those, this, you know, this sort of the, the Apollo period, and you know, they, they do something. They have a, a connection to me. They make me feel something. They are, Get moving into that world of, of artisticness. And even in the modern era, when you look at a photographer, say, I, I, I keep mentioning him on the channel, but he's a great photographer, uh, Dan Winters, very interested in space, massively so. And he also has taken photographs of, of, the, of the space shuttle. He's a book called Last Flight, which is the document of the last days of the space shuttle. He, he documents a lot of the archival stuff, you know, Armstrong's gloves, spacesuits, you know, those kind of things. Those images, again, they are, they feel scientific. They have a clinicalness about them. And yet, they also feel artistic. It's just, you know, maybe it's something that you could, you, you, you could think about in your own work that if you do feel that maybe you do not have an artistic bent, you know, a lot of photographers feel that, you know, they want to rely heavily on, on you know, technique and, and sharpness and, you know, that sort of thing. Because it's safe, it's quantifiable, you can repeat it. You know, you can, something is it's either in focus or it's not in focus. Those kind of things. That if you feel that that's where you are most comfortable, you know, that, that you want to exist in that world, then take a leaf from somebody like Dan Winters and make these images as precise, as clean, as detailed, as, you know, as, and I'm going to use the word sterile, which has a negative connotation, but it, these are photographs that are anything but sterile, but think about it in a more like a, a think about it like in a laboratory setting. Lean into the scientific nature of things and see if you can't find your artistic expression in that way. I've done a whole video about the beauty of NASA's space program photography. Please check it out over here, it's fantastic. I put a lot of effort into it, I'm very proud of it. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you ever so much for watching and I'll see you again soon.